thank you so much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to uh, be giving this talk. Um, I um, The way I have my computer set up here, uh, I'm running the slides from my iPad, so I can see all your squares. Um, if, uh, if you felt like putting on your camera, um, that would be welcome. So then I'm not uh, just speaking into the void, but I totally understand if not. Um, and um, I also want to say, uh, you know, with these virtual seminars, um, sometimes it can be a little bit, feel a little awkward to be more interactive, but um, especially because I'm staring at the screen, I can see, I should open the chat. Uh, I can see um, the chat. I can see if you raise your hand. So um, please feel free to interrupt me um, and uh, let's, um, hopefully we'll have some fun together and I, I can tell you about some stuff I've been excited about the last, um, oh, at this point going on 10 years or so. Um, okay, so um, what I want to do today is give you um, a general overview of um, one sort of class of signatures of dark shower searches that uh, has been a topic, uh, like I said, I've been interested in for quite a while. Um, I'll highlight uh, some ideas um, going back even to our first papers on the subject. And um, and tell you uh, also about um, some. I'll briefly flash some uh, recent results coming out of Atlas and CMS uh, that's um, all connected to this. Um, okay, and uh, so I also uh, I like to you know have a lot of visual stuff on my slides. Um, so I thought this was great. Um, uh, if you haven't played with these machine learning tools, this is from Dali. Um, and I just typed uh, Large Hadron Collider Dark Sector, and this is what it gave me. I thought it was uh, pretty appropriate. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll be doing something like this uh, at, at Atlas and CMS soon. Okay, so to begin, um, you know, there's this big picture question of, um, well, what's going on in the dark sector? And uh, the, of course, we've been asking this question for for decades at this point. Um, but uh, the paradigm of WIMPs is extremely well developed. Uh, we have searches in direct detection, indirect detection at the LHC. Um, I still think it's interesting. It's uh, viable, for example, um, one of the simplest WIMPs that we know still is, um, is a viable dark matter candidate. Uh, we know at 3TEV. So it's not that we should give up on this, but the program is mature. And so um, as theorists, you know, it's our job to think more broadly, uh, what other things can we offer the experimental community uh, to potentially have an impact? Of course, we don't know what's going on in the dark sector. It could be uh, more complicated. It could be something um, more standard model like in its richness, and it could involve strong dynamics, et cetera. And so we're going to take that idea seriously today and, um, and see if we can design some new types of LHC searches that'll be sensitive to um, dark uh, dark sector phenomenology that involves uh, strong coupling. And of course, at the end of the day, we just want to make sure that if there's something out there, we're going to find it. Okay, and that's really a central theme of my work, and of course, I'm sure for many of you, is um, you know we have the richness of the LHC data. We want to make sure we get everything we can out of it. Certainly, we want to try to um, exclude any model we can, but but really, of course, our goal is to discover something. And so we want to make sure if there's new physics lurking in the data that we're not going to miss it. So at this point, we have two uh, complementary paradigms uh, for organizing the way we think about new physics searches at the LHC. And I'll talk a little bit about both of these. They'll, they'll appear in the talk. It's not really the focus here. Um, but uh, just because it'll come up, I think it's important to, um, to set the stage here. We have the idea of simplified models where we add uh, the sort of minimal ingredients we need to generate a particular kind of signature. Um, so here I have Bart Simpson uh, writing out the Luino Neutralino simplified model, um, which gives a rich uh, Jets plus Met signature and is extremely well studied. Um, but if we're interested in more indirect effects of new physics, uh, it can be useful to parameterize that in terms of an effective field theory description, um, where instead we 
add higher dimension operators to the standard model. And those uh, are a reflection, a hypothesis for new physics that's heavy uh, that maybe we can't produce directly, but leaves an indirect imprint on our, uh, on our, our distributions of standard model particles. We can also use these higher dimension operators as a way of connecting the dark between the standard model and the dark sector. So that's the way it'll it'll appear today. We'll have some uh, simplified simplified model like approaches to talking about dark matter phenomenology, and we'll use sometimes simplified models, sometimes um, higher dimension operators to connect between the dark sector and uh, the standard model. Um, so here's the paradigm we're going to be discussing. Um, we have the standard model. It's connected to a dark sector, which will um, specify, at least in some kind of minimal way, um, through uh, what we call a portal. Okay, and again, we'll uh, depending on the phenomenology of interest, we can vary the portal. It could be um, some new particle, or it could just be that we connect the dark sector and the standard model directly with a higher dimension operator. So when we talk about WIMPs at the LHC, we have a weakly coupled dark sector. Here again is sort of expressed in the paradigm uh, on this side of supersymmetry, uh, minimal supersymmetry. So we have a uh, squark production at the LHC and squarks can decay to uh, quarks and neutralinos. And that gives us signatures and jets plus missing energy. And of course, uh, we can also uh, think about weakly coupled dark sectors from the effective field theory point of view. We integrate out some uh, heavy new physics, and perhaps the minimal signature of dark matter will be that we pair produce dark matter through some kind of coupling, which would just give us missing energy. So in order to uh, have there be a visible signature, uh, we need some visible particle produced. So here is the sort of prototypical example of having a um, initial state radiation gluino uh, radiated off the quarks, um, giving us a signature that we can see in jets plus missing energy. So now let's turn to the topic of uh, today's talk, which is um, dark sectors that involve strong dynamics. And um, strongly coupled dark sectors are a lot more complicated than the weakly coupled example I showed in the last slide. Um, here we're imagining we have pair production off protons. Okay, so there's some production mechanism gives us dark quarks, but then the dark quarks carry dark color. So they're gonna undergo a dark parton shower. So that's illustrated by um, all of these uh, shower effects, this gluon radiation, dark gluon radiation. Then those dark quarks that are produced in the shower are going to hadronize into dark mesons. And so that's in the green here. Some of those dark mesons could decay back to the standard model in this talk, we're going to focus on uh, decays back to standard model quarks. Okay, so it's going to give us again signatures in jets plus missing energy. But some of these dark mesons could just be stable. Okay, and so or at least stable on collider time scales. So they leave the detector undetected and give us uh, jets plus missing energy. Okay, so this is kind of this is a cartoon of the kinds of signatures we're going to be interested in today. So the, you could think of this as a feature or as a flaw, but it's just the reality of the situation, which is that the theory possibilities are completely overwhelming, okay? So of course the standard model is fixed, but the rest of it is, um, is sort of fair game. As long as you're following the rules of quantum field theory, uh, you can write down an infinite number of possible dark sectors connected to the standard model by a portal. Um, so the attitude that we're going to take is we're really going to be focused on the LHC phenomenology. And so we want to have um, essentially a way of parametrizing uh, a huge class of models, not all of them, but a wide class in terms of a finite number of parameters that are relevant for the LHC searches. OK, um, so that's going to be our goal. And one thing that helps organize thinking about the sort of paradigm of dark sectors in general is the fact that the portals, at least, there's a finite number of renormalizable options. And of course, the 
renormalizable meaning that the connection is either through uh, some new state or through a low dimension operator. Um, and that's important because, of course, as you when you add high dimension operators, those are irrelevant at low energies. And so we anticipate that whatever the portal is, it's going to be due either to some new state or due to um, some uh, low dimension operator in an EFT language. And so um, the and and in fairness, the portal really is a major driver of the phenomenology because that tells you how it's how you're going to get yourself into the dark sector and how you're going to get decays back out of the dark sector. And so um, so thinking about the portals really focusing on that is um, is is helpful in not being too overwhelmed by uh, by all the options. OK, so let's focus on the portal. Um, so we want here, again, because we're going to be interested in jets plus missing energy, we want a portal to the quarks. So the EFT approach using a contact operator looks like this, OK? So this is the same thing I showed in the weakly coupled example, except that uh, now we're imagining that these highs are charged under some dark QCD-like group, OK? some. So they're going to undergo a dark shower. Um, and then um, we have um, these two options where we have of, of completing this in a simple way. <clears throat> so we can complete it in a so-called S-channel model where we introduce a particle, say, a new vector that propagates in the S-channel in the, in the two to two diagram. Uh, so we'll call that a Z prime, for example. And then we have the option of a T-channel model where instead we introduce a coupling between um, the quark and the dark quark and some new scalar particle that's charged under both QCD and the dark QCD group. And then um, this gives us a dominant process in T-channel exchange. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about both these simplified models today, and you'll see um, that actually the T-channel model is quite rich. And, um, and so it's, you know, you draw this, you sort of include this coupling because you're motivated to try to have a simple two to two uh, UV completion in the T-channel, but actually it predicts um, a pretty rich set of diagrams um, that all have to be there. And so that's something important to keep in mind. Um, I should also say that there are now um, the, the sort of where we're headed is this idea, this phenomenological idea of semi-visible jets. And, um, and so, which of course I haven't introduced yet, but I'll explain soon. Um, but both Atlas and CMS now have searches for semi-visible jets. Uh, CMS looked for this S-channel model, essentially, and um, Atlas looked for the uh, T-channel model. So um, this topic is, uh, in my view, uh, should be phenomena-driven. Um, there's also some important uh, theory work to be done, and there's already some nice papers uh, that exist uh, thinking about um, the theories, but but for my interest at least, um, it's really been to think about this from what can we see at the LHC? What kinds of effects could emerge at the LHC due to strong dynamics in the hidden sector? And so the idea that we had um, a while ago now is this idea of semi-visible jets, a very simple idea that, that will be the topic of the rest of the talk. But I just wanna highlight, there's also these ideas of lepton jets, uh, closely related, but instead you have sprays of leptons uh, that are collimated together, which makes the phenomenology at the LEC a little bit uh, more challenging and interesting. Um, you have this idea of emerging jets. It sounds like you had a talk on this uh, very recently. And then there are maybe even more exotic ideas. Um, this idea of soft bombs, um, which I just want to highlight is, a, you know, you would produce a very diffuse low energy uh, set of radiation um, that would be very hard to trigger on. There's this great idea of quirks where you have, you pair produce uh, basically dark quirks again, but the confinement scale is so low that what ends up happening is you get macroscopic strings form and you can get uh, basically these kinds of crazy um, patterns in the LHC as these things shed their angular momentum and decay um, sort of the, the dark quarks come together to annihilate 
at the end of some very fantastic uh, looking events. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the most exciting thing uh, would be new ideas. And so um, I'm sure there are other ways we could imagine the dark sector could appear at the LHC. Um, and uh, those ideas are just waiting to be discovered and uh, fleshed out so that they could be implemented at the experiment. Okay, so um, my focus on this has been on this idea of semi-visible jets. So let me uh, explain what I mean. This was a, an idea we had, again, just trying to think about what would be um, some very just uh, simple, uh, and, and hopefully easy to parameterize predictions of having strong dynamics in a dark sector that you might see at the LHC. So here's the idea. We assume there's some dark sector quarked chi and that their dominant interaction to the standard model, the portal, uh, is dominated by uh, QCD. Okay, So we're always going to be talking about signatures and jets of missing energy here. Okay. And what happens is you pair produce these dark quarks. Okay, so this is some portal makes the dark quarks, and then they undergo a shower, they hadronize, and then they decay. Some of them decay back to QCD. And what this gives you, naively at least, is it gives you missing energy aligned with your jets. So if you've uh, spent any amount of time thinking about jets plus missing energy searches, um, which is something uh, I've spent a lot of time with over the years in, in various contexts. Um, what you may know is that when the missing energy is aligned with the jets, this is one of the primary backgrounds of uh, any jets plus met analysis because QCD mismeasurement gives you missing energy. And so, and that's very hard to model. And so one of the pre-selection cuts that they typically do in these searches at the experiments is very, a, a very, smart thing to do, which is just cut away events where the missing energy is aligned with the jet, because that's probably coming from uh, mismeasurement. So if you like, semi-visible jets are a bit of a perverse idea from the point of view of um, jets plus met searches, because what they do is they naively populate uh, this region that is uh, dominated by mismeasurement. Okay, So that makes it a more challenging search to do. And as I'll show you, at least in our phenomenology studies, the um, when we look in the bin of jets aligned with MET, that's where we see um, that we're, we get better sensitivity to semi-visible jet signatures. OK, um, so uh, our first paper here, um, just a, sh a short one, making this simple point and uh, the real idea there was to provide a phenomenological parameterization, which I like to call um, simplified model-like. It's not a simplified model, okay? Because a simplified model is a concrete uh, uh, perturbative quantum field theory model where you, in principle, can co compute everything. In uh, our parameterization that we introduced in this paper here, the idea was to give a minimal number of parameters to scan over in some kind of simulation that would maximally impact the phenomenological consequences at ATLAS and CMS. And so, uh, so let me just walk you through the parameterization. Of course, if you're doing, and, and let me also emphasize, you know, one of the things that, that we really are advocating for here is if you want to use this parameterization, then you should make sure and design very inclusive searches. If you start to say, look at detailed properties of the jets that are coming out, of course, you're going to be sensitive to much more microscopic details of the model. Um, but one of the themes later in the talk will be that um, we don't actually know how to predict the detailed properties of these models because it involves hadronization and strong dynamics. And so we have to be extremely careful if we want to try to do anything more than just a very inclusive jets plus missing energy search, it's critical that we think carefully about the theoretical uncertainty in our predictions. Okay, so that's the spirit here. It's it's really the one of the main messages of my talk is that um, we uh, you know we should be doing things that are inclusive, especially because the landscape of possible theories is so vast that honing in on one particular theory um, seems sort of out of the spirit of this idea of the dark sector paradigm, 
We really want to be covering as much territory as possible. Of course, if we saw a deviation from the standard model, then we would study it to death. And, uh, and I can assure you that, uh, you know, a huge fraction of the community uh, would turn their attention to building models, making better predictions, and so on. Okay. So here's the parameterization. Um, there's some uh, strong coupling in the dark sector. Uh, it's probably better to think about it in terms of a confinement scale, lambda dark, okay? But equivalently, you can specify it in terms of a running coupling, alpha dark. And at least back in the, at the time, um, this was the, the way, the easier way to do it in Pythia, the simulation tool that we'll use. And so um, anyway, you'll see um, a plot involving specifying alpha dark. Then um, there's this uh, parameter, which is, again, a very simple idea, um, which is just the invisible ratio, okay? So this is one of the important parameters here, because again, in this paradigm where we're generating uh, missing energy by having, uh, by making stable mesons in the shower, stable dark mesons, that's something we don't know how to calculate in detail. And so the, um, so depending on the detail properties of the dark sector, you're going to get different values for the average number of invisible particles that get generated in the parton shower, in the dark sector parton shower. And so um, what our invisible does is it lets you just parameterize your ignorance, okay? So we can go from our invisible equals zero, where all the dark mesons that are produced decay back to the standard model, okay? That gives us just uh, signatures with no missing energy. So those would just be weird looking jets. Okay. And that's interesting too. People um, are looking for these kinds of things. There are, you know, model agnostic machine learning tools. There's all kinds of phenomenology people are interested in here. But for us, this is kind of a, a, a limiting case um, that we're less interested in just because um, we're, we're, the phenomenology, the kinds of searches we want to do are jets plus missing energy. And this has essentially no missing energy. Then there's moderate R invisible where you get semi-visible jets. They look like uh, what I described in the previous slide. And as you go to R invisible of one, now what you have is you're back to essentially the weakly coupled example uh, where you're recoiling all of your dark matter <clears throat> against some initial state radiation jet. Um, now, of course, this is not just the pair production of two WIMPs, the way it was in the weekly coupled case, but it's all dark. So the LHC doesn't care, right? And, and so distinguishing this from uh, the um, weekly coupled example uh, is gonna require other handles. I mean, uh, you can't do it just by, by looking at this signature, okay? All right, so that's our invisible. And then there's basically a mass scale or mass scales for the dark mesons, of course, we know from QCD that uh, we should expect to have a rich spectrum of mesons in the dark sector, but uh, it's also the case, and we and this is also confirmed in QCD, that the majority of what's produced in a parton shower are the lightest mesons. You basically are exponentially suppressed to produce heavier mesons. And so the, um, the idea of uh, including just one parameter here, as certainly in early stages of doing these searches, I think is reasonable. Um, but this is something that uh, uh, is, you know, easy in the simulation. You just add different spectra for the different mesons, and you can see if it has an impact on the search you're doing. Again, in the spirit of being maximally inclusive, if you're doing something that's really sensitive to this mass scale, then um, you're probably overly relying on the detailed properties of the simulation, which are not under theoretical control. And finally, there's uh, the, the cross-section just to produce the stuff, okay? So that depends on which portal you're using. So if I pick one of the portals, maybe I need to have a cross-section and a mass for the mediator particle. Um, but uh, if I'm just using a contact interaction to produce the portal, then essentially that contact interaction gives me some production cross-section strength. Okay. So um, this, these are plots now from, uh, from an aging study uh, from 2017, um, but they give you the basic idea, uh, just confirm this intuition that I've been uh, trying to develop here, okay? So here, these are simulations using the Pythia Hidden Valley module. Um, by the way, 
you know, back when we were doing this, you had to hack it a bit. Um, now it's getting more and more mature. And so if you're interested in this, there's a pretty low bar, especially if you know how to use Pythia, to just um, using the Hidden Valley module. And um, and I should say, I haven't, I haven't used that phrase yet, but, um, you know, Hidden Valleys uh, was an idea for, that um, that essentially is one of the one of the ideas that kicked off this whole dark sector paradigm. I think it was back in 2006. Um, and so, uh, of course, all these things are just different uh, ways of saying saying something very similar. Um, now we we like to call it dark sectors. I think that um, it just uh, makes us it sounds better. It makes us think that we're connecting to dark matter, but um, but the idea is, is very much the same. And so in um, in hidden valleys. Um, you would produce some uh, dark sector pions, just like what we're talking about here. Um, and because of that, in Pythia, the, um, the module that you can use to generate these kinds of signatures is called the Hidden Valley module. Um, and it's in the manual. If you just look for Hidden Valleys, you'll see it there. Okay. So we used the then state-of-the-art Hidden Valley module. It's undergone many improvements since then. Um, which is which is fantastic, and uh, and I know um, there's people in Pythia hard at work trying to just make it better and better all the time, um, and um, and so what's done here is um, uh, we just produce the dark quarks off the, uh, the contact interaction with quarks. Okay, so we have QQ bar goes to chi chi bar through a contact interaction, and here what I'm showing you is um, delta phi, which is this variable. That's basically the angle between uh, the it's the the minimum angle between the missing energy and the jets in the event. Okay, so you look at all the jets. You have the direction for missing energy. You find the jet that's most aligned with um, with the met, and you call the angle delta phi between them in the eta phi plane. Uh, the um, this this parameter here. Okay, and what you see is unsurprisingly. Um, R invisible, remember R invisible equals zero means uh, no met, okay? Um, and so that's in this light blue line here. But as you crank up R invisible, you see you get more and more events um, that where the met and the jet are aligned, just as we would have expected intuitively, okay? And again, here's uh, another classic variable, a missing energy distribution, okay? Again, when we have R invisible equals zero, we have essentially no met. As we crank up our invisible, we get a reasonable met distribution. Okay, um, and for reference, uh, here's some stereo model backgrounds, and um, and so the uh, um, and what you see again are the uh, are the expected distribution. Okay, um, so uh, I'm sorry, I said I said something wrong here. So. Um, the uh, um, I, I just <laughs> I pointed to the wrong side of this plot. I think sorry, it's early here. Um, the um, yeah, so so we're interested, of course, in the signal region, right, where QCD is peaking here at low delta phi and and here at low delta phi. Sorry, I said that backwards. Okay, so um, let's let's talk about benchmarking. Okay, so let's um, let's pick a portal. So in this case, we picked the contact operator. Okay. And now let's pick some parameters. Um, so we have um, uh, just for some choice of parameter, we pick lambda dark equals 20 times lambda QCD. Okay, this is going to give us some separation between um, QCD jets and dark jets. Uh, we'll pick our invisible of a half, and we'll pick uh, the mass in the dark sector to be about 10 GeV. And that means that. Um, you know these two scales are essentially the same. Okay, so we're we're picking kind of a one it, it, minimizing the number of uh, of scales in the problem uh, again just to keep it as simple as possible. And then we want to determine a limit on uh, the portal cross section. Okay, so um, again, this is from this 2017 paper of ours. Um, this is this is again just to give you a flavor for things. Um, so what we have here are. Um, are two different kinds of searches, okay? So we have a search where we uh, include events with, uh, where we cut away the events where the jets are aligned with the met, okay? So that's this delta phi greater than 0.4, that's the solid lines here. And then delta phi less than 0.4 are the 
uh, events where the jet is aligned with the Met, okay? And what we see are as um, R invisible goes from uh, zero to one, right? Remember one is the region where it's very WIMP-like, okay? So that's where we would expect the, the standard QCD searches uh, to be relevant. And sure enough, that's the solid line. And you see that the projected limits are strongest over here when R invisible equals one, that the standard approach beats the sort of semi-visible jet approach, okay? And then as we go to lower R invisible, where it looks more and more semi-visible jet-like, we see that these dash curves uh, start to win, okay? And so in particular, um, you know, if you look at this blue one, right, there's this crossover point uh, at our invisible 0.8. Now, these are not numbers I want you to take seriously at all. Um, it's just to give you, you know, this is a, a relatively simple phenomenologist level study. Um, but it again, it just shows that this uh, naive intuition about how we would search for semi-visible jets plays out, that those distributions on the last slide could be converted into projected limits Okay, doing some very reasonable, just this is just simple cut and count stuff. Okay, and um, the uh, uh, S channel and T channel models um, are uh, also studied in our paper. Uh, there's a lot of detail in the paper if you're interested, so you can go check it out there. Okay, um, so hopefully, this uh, is uh, compelling evidence that um, there's a new signal region that could that we could develop at the LHC uh, to look for these objects. Okay. But of course, as I've been emphasizing, there's a lot of model dependence, okay? So let's dig into that a little deeper. There's the model dependence of production, okay? Here, what we wanna do is we pick a portal that gives us a Lagrangian, and then we get uh, some perturbative calculation that we can use to um, determine the production, determine the, say, distributions that come out of pair producing the dark quarks, et cetera. Once we've made the dark quarks, then they undergo a parton shower, okay? Now here, we need to pick a number of colors and a number of flavors in the dark sector. This determines the Sudikov uh, factor, right? Which is just standard uh, QCD technology, which gives us a parton shower and there, there's, again, there's this standard um, Sudikov approach where, you know, even though we're resumming a huge class of diagrams, it's still in the perturbative regime. And so this is actually well under theoretical control. And I'll show you a little later a study we did um, where we use some analytic results um, and that, you know, indeed, we, we really do have analytic control of thinking about the shower. Um, Notice here, of course, in detail, you need to pick the number of colors and the number of flavors. But again, if you're doing something inclusive at the LHC, then um, you don't really care about the detailed structure of what's happening inside the jet, okay? Really, you're using R invisible as a way to um, parameterize what's happening in the parton shower and these other steps, okay? Um, then we get to hadronization, and that's really the, the issue with making these predictions, is that we both need to know the spectrum, which we don't know how to calculate unless we do a detailed lat uh, lattice QCD study, which are very expensive. And so, of course, there's work that could probably be done here, pick some uh, dark sectors and do some simulations. I know there are already some results in the literature on this, um, but you know, maybe maybe we could survey uh, something by collaborating with the lattice community. But honestly, they have you know important things to do just studying the standard model. And so I think um, uh, here we just you know at some level we can uh, use our intuition. We can use say the chiral limit. There are various other tools we have, but um, but at some level we just choose this as a free parameter. Okay, um, and. Then once we know the spectrum, we need to use that to determine fragmentation functions so that we know what the population of the dark mesons is gonna be that's produced by the shower. And all of this, both these things are non-perturbative, okay? And so um, we just don't know in detail um, uh, how to make these predictions, okay? We can come up with phenomenological models and that's what we do. Now in QCD, of course, we have phenomenological models for these things um, but then we tune them to data, 
And so here we don't have data to tune to. Okay, so it, it really is not um, not something that we that we can know. Um, so we make a best guess, and uh, and of course we can vary phenomenological parameters to see how much uncertainty that generates, and to ensure that any search we're doing is not overly sensitive to these parameters. And then finally, we need to know how it decays back to the standard model, and this of course depends on both the spectrum and the portal. Okay. Okay, so um, let's just talk about some of these steps in a little bit more detail. So the production in the T-channel model, this is a diagram pulled from MagGraph, okay? So uh, here we're pair producing the dark quarks as promised, but the thing I want to emphasize to you is that um, this uh, is not the only diagram, okay? So in the T-channel model, we're going to want to use matching because we're doing jets plus missing energy searches, okay? So we're going to want to um, use this very nice technology that's built into MagGraph at this point uh, for, you know, maximizing the utility of the hard matrix elements to compute initial state radiation and the regions of phase space where it, those predictions are best. Um, and so these are higher body diagrams and now look at, um, you know, new types of topologies that are showing up um, in this T-channel model. It's not just a T-channel diagram, okay? For example, this where we have a light quark here in uh, in this T-channel propagator. Anyway, T-channel doesn't really make sense beyond two to two anyway, right? And so, um, and if we go even a higher order, now we get diagrams where we're pair producing the, um, the mediators themselves, okay? And so, you know, of course you should, you can just think about this as on-shell production, um, but when you're generating these events in the simulation, you have to be careful to not double count. Okay, so there's subtleties to worry about here. Um, and um, and so, again, this is really going to change the spectrum of what you see just from perturbative production that's completely under theoretical control. Okay, so even though you might think, oh, I just completed the model in the T-channel, so I just have something that looks almost exactly like a contact operator, actually know um, if these mediators are light enough, which they probably need to be in order to have the production be relevant at the LHC, then um, they can go on shell, okay? Again, showering is under reasonable theoretical control. This is a figure from that 2017 paper. Again, just showing uh, essentially the number of uh, dark particles you expect to get um, as you vary the parameters, okay? So, um, and this is something uh, again, in the simplified model like parameterization for semi-visible jets, um, the uh, you know here we're just varying our invisible and um, and sort of maximizing the number of dark particles over here. Notice, unfortunately, um, we should have plotted this uh, with uh, the mass scale for the dark uh, QCD instead, um, because you see this this change that's happening, but that has to do with uh, thresholds crossing each other. So if you knew what these mass scales were, this 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 behavior over here would make more sense. But anyway, uh, Pythia is doing something completely reasonable. Um, it, it knows uh, where the strong coupling mass scale is, and it knows the mass of the dark mason. Okay. And then we have hadronization and decay, okay? And so again, as I've emphasized, there's all of these non-perturbative contributions and so we just need to be phenomenologists, and um, and so we you know choose some spectrum uh, that seems reasonable. We try not to be too sensitive to it in the way we design the search. Or if you like, you can say I'm going to make the hypothesis that the dark meson mass is this, and then I'm going to design a search that looks for some feature that depends on that. That's also fine. Um, but really, if you are relying on fragmentation on any kinds of detailed properties of the um, of, of the structure of the jets, you really have to take care, okay? Um, and finally, with decay, there's this subtlety, which I think is important to keep in mind, which is that um, actually there's also richness here. Naively, you would expect to be making some number of vector mesons, some number of scalar mesons in the dark shower, even in the simplest scenario. And the naive picture is that you would make three times as many vector mesons than scalar mesons just by degree of freedom counting. But then if you look at the decays, so you might say, okay, why do I care if they all decay back to quarks? Well, the vector mesons decay uh, uh, essentially promptly 
while the scalar mesons have a chirality suppression, just like pions and QCD do, right? The charge pion decays more often to the muon and the muon neutrino over the electron, right? Suppressed by the mass, uh, uh, mass of the of the muon versus the electron, and that's a chirality suppression, right? That that that's because you need an extra helicity flip uh, to make all the spins work and to conserve angular momentum. And so the same thing is going to happen here. And so you actually might expect to have some fraction of your semi-visible jet involve uh, particles with some non-trivial lifetimes. And not only that, but because of chirality suppressed, you would expect them to decay to the heaviest quarks they can most often, right? So really, even though the searches aren't incorporating this at this point, in my mind, the real signature of a semi-visible jet is prompt decays to, to uh, quarks democratically, and then buried inside those jets are some suppressed decays to B quarks. And, um, and so it's really a, quite a rich signature, even without knowing all of this non-perturbative stuff, okay? Um, so I'm not gonna go into the details of this at all. Uh, they deserve to be talks all on their own. And if you're interested, you should contact uh, the great folks who did these searches. Um, but uh, I just want to say that, um, uh, especially because I'm proud of um, uh, having having help behind the scenes to make this happen um, for many, many years at this point, uh, CMS now has a search on the archive. I think maybe uh, this one has even gone through publication uh, or it's in the process, I forget, um, where they put the first limits on the so-called S-channel model with a Z prime, okay? Um, and sure enough, they use uh, something very much like what we proposed, right? This delta phi uh, min between the jets and the met. Um, and they get limits, it's amazing. Um, and uh, and they, uh, they also um, provided stronger limits where they did something using some machine learning tools. Um, and, uh, but here again, I just caution that, you know, uh, you if you're gonna, if you're gonna look into that, uh, you wanna be very careful to, um, to be sure you understand the assumptions of the simulation because this kind of stuff is going to be more sensitive to those effects. And then there's also an atlas search. It's in this conf note here, and they looked for the T-channel model, okay? And again, they put some upper limits on the coupling lambda here between uh, the um, dark quarks and the mediator, okay? So it's very exciting. Notice also the years here. This just came out, okay? 2022, this one was late uh, in 21. Okay, so these are very fresh and um, and expect more, okay? Both there's now, now I, I, I'm sure you know, you know, once a, uh, trying to get a new type of search done at these experiments is uh, is a heroic effort and, um, and kudos to the teams that, that pushed this through. It was a huge amount of work, especially because it involves new types of simulation, um, and uh, there were a lot of pitfalls, and um, and so it really took perseverance to get this done. I'm very very proud of both these teams. Um, they're great people involved. Now that this is something that Atlas and CMS do, then um, it sparks a lot more interest. And so the, the community of people who are interested in this is growing. We had a very successful workshop last uh, summer on semi-visible jets. Um, for for example. Uh, run by a combination of Atlas and CMS folks uh, that I helped organize. Um, so this is just a growing uh, subfield and uh, you should keep an eye on it for future searches and all kinds of cool new ideas coming out of the experiments. Okay, so I have 15 minutes left. Um, and uh, so let me just uh, uh, quickly discuss uh, where to go from here and some more recent work of ours. So of course, again, I just want to emphasize that um, you know new phenomena. Looking for new phenomena, that's really that would be the greatest thing. Okay, so if you come up with an idea for a way that a dark sector could manifest at the LHC or another experiment for that matter, um, to me that that's really would be extremely exciting. You know, again, we want to make sure if there's something out there, we're going to find it. But if we're going to stick to uh, dark showers at the LHC. Um, we want to work on better observables. And of course, um, can't blame anyone for wanting to try to do something with jet substructure because it's cool. It's exciting. These are weird looking jets. How can we tell uh, that we're making weird looking jets at the LHC? Okay, so of course you want to use jet substructure. This, again, is subject to all of the problems that I've been 
uh, bringing up with the hadronization, fragmentation, et cetera. Okay. So um, in a paper from a few years ago uh, with my uh, former student and postdoc, we looked into trying to characterize uh, the size of a theoretical error bar from dark substructure. Okay. And so what we did, we combined basically, uh, um, so it was, sorry, let me say the observable here is essentially jet mass. Okay. The generalization of jet mass, but, um, but these plots are literally jet mass. Okay. So this is jet mass is the simplest substructure observable, right? If a jet were uh, just a quark or a gluon, it would have zero mass. So the fact that there's some distribution inside the jet gives you a non-zero mass. And um, we, uh, so what we did is we took some uh, perturbative calculations from the QCD literature, some to leading log and some modified leading log, um, almost full next to leading log. Those gave us these uh, contours here, okay, um, in theory predictions for the jet mass. And then we also uh, did Pythia simulations where we just did Pythia at the parton level, and then we did Pythia and we let it hadronize, and that gave us these distributions in the dots, okay? And then we said, okay, let's do the sort of most agnostic thing we can here, and let's just profile over uh, the uncertainty. And so we um, developed, uh, I mean, this is just a very simple idea, right? But basically we wanted to be um, as conservative as possible, and so we just envelope over this and call this a theory system. Okay, so this gives you a sense. By the way, going into this, we had no idea how big this error bar was going to be. And I was delighted to see that at least for a, a simple observable like jet mass where we can make predictions, that the envelope was not completely overwhelming, right? You could have imagined the error bar here was so big that you could never hope to use jet mass in a search. Excuse me. Um, so can we go back please. to the previous slide? Can yeah. you explain again what is a uh, modified leading order do you mean here? And why you need to compare these two leading order and modify leading order here? So um, the the idea was um, that when, you know, it's very hard to characterize an error bar on a theory prediction, right? I mean, yes. in, in one, sorry? Yeah, right, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yes. so one, one point of view you could take Okay, a very conservative point of view one could take is um, I do a leading order calculation and I don't know what the error is. So then I could do a next to leading order calculation. And the most conservative interpretation of the next to leading order calculation is that its purpose is to give you an error bar in the leading order calculation. Now, of course, people who work hard, they spend years doing these, these heroic next to leading order calculations. They don't want to they want to present the next leading order calculation as a prediction. And you could use that as the central value, but really it's the difference between the leading thing and the next leading thing that gives you a sense of your theoretical uncertainty. Now, of course, in that community, they do all kinds of sophisticated things, varying uh, factorization scales and so on, and that's fine. But because we were trying to be extremely conservative, that was our attitude here, was we just wanted to look at the difference between the two uh, between the leading log and the and the state of the art um, next to leading log calculation, and and take that as the theoretical error bar. So this is trying to be extremely conservative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so we, um, if you go and look at the paper, we we provide lots of different plots and and ways of thinking about this and explored. Uh, here we're exploring variations in. Um, the hadronization scale, uh, sorry, the uh, the confinement scale in the dark sector. Um, and we also explored uh, hadronization errors here. We just did this numerically um, using Pythia and varying the parameters in Pythia to sort of extremes. Um, and you can see, of course, unsurprisingly, that uh, the, the hadronization error is uh, definitely contributes significantly to this envelope, okay? Um, here we're looking, uh, by the way, these have different values of this beta parameter. Um, the, this is jet mass. This is more sensitive. This beta equals 0.5 is, is pushing into the regime where um, actually we don't even have control anymore. So it's really much more sensitive to um, uh, the detailed properties of the substructure. So this gives you at least some sense of how things scale um, as you go from the sort of simplest substructure variable to something that's a bit more sensitive. Now. Um, 
this work sort of uh, uh, serves to highlight that maybe if we're careful, we can use substructure in a search. However, this was a ton of work and, um, and, it's in, and it relied on calculations that were done for this specific observable. And so um, if you wanna include some analytic results, it's, uh, it really requires uh, going observable by observable. And so um, we don't really know how to scale this, right? If you wanted to say, con consider all kinds of different substructure variables and actually include a theory uncertainty, of course you can do the Pythia level study and I would recommend it, but, um, but just note that um, generalizing this is, is something that really requires a lot of effort. Um, so, so I see it more as a proof of principle than something that could be done, could be used across the spectrum in practice. Okay, um, in my last few minutes, I wanna highlight um, uh, some work that just came out this year uh, where we looked into um, using the Lund jet plane um, which is a recent, somewhat recent idea from these uh, phenomenal QCD theorists. Um, and, um, and basically as a, as a way to attempt to isolate the parts of the jet that are most sensitive to hadronization, okay? So I'm not gonna go into this in detail. Uh, there is this truly fantastic paper here. Um, and uh, actually you can find talks by uh, these authors that, that also have lots of great illustrations. Um, but the basic idea is that this Lund diagram, um, which essentially you declustered the jet and then you plot properties of the various splittings uh, that you find in that declustering, um, and when you organize them in terms of the momentum transfer and the angle between the splittings, what you find is that um, these Lund diagrams isolate uh, the parts of phase space that are dominated by uh, hadronization, okay? So here's a nice um, uh, figure I found in a talk by Gavin Salam. Uh, it was very easy. If you just Google Gavin Salam and Lund Jet Plane, you can find this, this set of slides. They're fantastic. Um, if you're interested in this, I definitely recommend them. And he drew this really nice figure of different types of uh, sort of splitting trees that could come off a hard line and where they lie in the Lund Jet Plane. Okay. And this is a summary from the paper. Basically, the point is that they that they show that the non-perturbative regime is when you have small momentum transfer, unsurprisingly. And so by plotting things in the Lund jet plane, you can really isolate the non-perturbative regime down here at the bottom, okay? And so we applied that to dark jets. So this is with uh, Jennifer Roloff, a fantastic uh, postdoc on Atlas, uh, and Christian Sherb, who's a postdoc now in the theory group at Berkeley, um, and just came out earlier this year, okay? Uh, so it's just a short paper where we did, basically, we used the Pythia simulation and we um, explored the idea that the Lund jet plane might help us mitigate this hadronization uncertainty. So over here, we're basically comparing the um, Pythia prediction to, uh, to a very simple leading log prediction, um, again, from the original paper, uh, basically, showing that um, the effects of you know, varying the scale KT, just the running coupling gives you this kind of structure. Okay, so this is almost a one-liner to compute. And, um, and sure enough, we see that this is reproduced by the Pythia simulation. Here is just the ratio of the two. Um, but you can see that this uh, um, hotspot here, right, corresponds exactly to what we would expect uh, from the simple theory arguments, okay? And one thing we did in the paper, if you go look at it, is um, we did things like vary uh, the hadronization model just to see um, if the, uh, to, to again, see how much things change. And sure enough, up here in the Lund plane, everything stays pretty much the same. That's the part that's under theoretical control. But down here, below this dashed line, that's where we expect to be dominated by non-perturbative physics. Sure enough, we did these variations and that's what we see, okay? Um, and oh, and also I should highlight in the paper, something else we do is, um, is we plot the Lund jet plane for various stages of the simulation, okay? Just again, to explore how sensitive we are to hadronization. So we have um, basically all the steps of the process 
um, all separated out. So first you have uh, the dark shower parton shower, then the dark hadronization, then the decay back to standard model hadrons, then the standard model hadron uh, showering, and then uh, final, and then yeah, and those are I think all the steps. So we look at we look at all um, those various steps, and again gives you a sense of um, this this basic picture here, which is that the hadronization is indeed um, concentrated in the bottom of the Lund plane as we would expect. Okay, and then um, we haven't done a, a full search yet incorporating these ideas. Um, that's work in progress, but right now uh, the, the state of the art was just to show that um, some measure of performance versus resilience against varying hadronization parameters. So that's what this is showing. Um, this curve basically gives uh, the um, a naive measure of performance versus resilience to hadronization. Um, and uh, and you can see, right, this is better. And basically, we benchmark this against some uh, classic observables, okay, like the number of jet constituents or the jet mass. As I emphasized before, the jet mass is actually quite resilient, okay, um, but uh, but doesn't perform so well, okay. Um, and so again, you could imagine, you know, this is giving us some uh, way of optimizing uh, the the performance of our of something that might rely on substructure without being overly sensitive to uh, the unknowns from dark hadronization. And of course, um, it, it goes without saying that, you know, machine learning is probably going to help. Uh, of course, machine learning is um, a little bit intimidating because of these issues of wanting to mitigate your sensitivity to hadronization. And so, um, this is, this is uh, just a study from the Lunjet paper on QCD. This is all very good work. Um, applying machine learning tools to dark jets is something people have been doing, but um, in my view, there's still a lot left to do to be sure that the machine is insensitive to hadronization. Okay, so um, here's my last slide. I'm ending right on time, uh, which is great. Here's another of these uh, DALI images um, of dark sector uh, Large Hadron Collider dark sectors. Uh, again, you can feel yourself getting sucked into the dark sector here through Atlas or at some Atlas-like detector. I love these things. Anyway, um, so let me just quickly say, you know, there's a bright future. We're going to get more searches from Atlas and CMS, so keep an eye out for those. There's improvements to the simulations. Uh, I'm actually working with some folks on a pure glue ball uh, simulation um, that we're very excited about that kind of works with Pythia and, um, and may give us uh, another uh, type of simulation to use to do uh, these kinds of searches. We need to work on making our predictions more robust. We need to incorporate machine learning. There's tons to do exploring model space and connecting to say the relic density and so on. And of course, uh, you know, want to end on the idea that we're really in the business of trying to discover new physics. And so, um, uh, you know, the point of this is to do something that's robust so that if we see something weird in the data, uh, we actually are um, doing something reasonable and, um, and then we can take it from there and start to investigate uh, more deeply. Um, and so um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation again and for your attention. And um, I'm gonna end there and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Tim, very exciting talk. So any question or comment? from our audience. Yes, please. Um, okay, I'm reading this question in the chat. Are there some hints that one can decrease the parameters but still get good results compared to the existing results? Um, the uh, no, I think um, that uh, there's a lot left to do um, to study the dependence on these parameters. And so, um, uh, if you're thinking about the Atlas and the CMS searches, um, I mean, they they discuss this a little bit in those papers. I I definitely recommend going and taking a look. But um, but as you can tell from from uh, what I've been up to, I think that um, there's uh, there's still a lot to do. Um, uh, addressing exactly this question. And um, and so I think this is a very interesting and active area uh, for future exploration. Thanks for the question. 
any further questions? Hi, team. Sorry for missing. Uh, this is Lei. I'm sorry for uh, I missed your first part of your talk. So, so no, no. I have one question about the um, the the device or uh, as LTC. Uh, did they uh, have some plan for some specific uh, equipment to look for the dark shower signals? Oh, um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, so, uh, actually, in the in in one thing we're studying in this model where. Um, which is just a pure gluon dark shower. Um, there we expect to make dark blue balls with a variety of lifetimes. And in that I'm collaborating with David Curtin among others, uh, who, um, who you may know is uh, someone yeah. who is uh, been pro pro proposed this Methuselah experiment to look for long lived particles. And, yes. um, and so we're actually very excited in that project that there may be correlated signatures of some long lived blue balls uh, associated mm -hmm. with the same event where we get something that looks like semi-visible jets. And so yeah. he was telling me actually that there's, um, they're building, they're hoping to build a triggering system where they could use Methuselah to trigger on events. And so um, that could be very exciting, right? Is that Methuselah would see a long lived event, they would correlate it with this uh -huh. weird jet event and they would okay, be able yeah. to maybe. So that's the kind of ideas uh, that I'm aware of. Um, okay. And, you know, also, I should say that uh, just in general, um, somewhere where a lot of these things um, are, are making an impact is on the triggering strategies. So there are all of these ideas of doing faster and faster triggering on more complicated events. And so um, so the, my guess is that there's going to be triggers that are going to be, you know, sensitive to uh, weird looking substructure that are not quite... Um, that okay. look different from QCDs, something like that, right? Okay. So that's another example of technology that the experiments may uh, um, be uh, be changing the game and, and giving us some new handles. Okay, thanks. Okay, regarding the search uh, search for blue balls, so there may we may also have some uh, results from astrophysics and or from even from cosmology uh, observations or measurements. So compared with them, uh, uh, what what's the advantage of the collider or such as RGC uh, to in look for these uh, uh, exotic particles? Yeah, I think it just probes. Um, so we well, let me first say, I mean, we're in the process of developing uh, the simulation tool. So we don't we don't know exactly what the complementary parameter space will be, but um, the because you can tr control the lifetime of these things um, depending on the portal. You know, it can be long lived on uh, collider time scales, but not astrophysical cosmological time scales, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I think you know it's going to probe complementary parameter space for sure. Exactly how those things are going to overlap is something that you know we'll have to work out once we have our, our simulation better developed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I see one more here in the chat. Um, do I have any recommendations for effective machine learning algorithms in the dark sector? Um, no, this is something we're um, we're just now starting to explore. Uh, like I've been emphasizing in the talk, I've been kind of skeptical of using machine learning uh, for these kinds of searches because of the hadronization uncertainty and so on. I'm hoping now with this idea of the Lunjet plane that maybe we can um, have a target for machine learning that's um, where, where, we're where we're less sensitive to these effects. Um, you know, another thing you could imagine doing is there are these ideas of adversarial machine learning where you train a machine against another machine in order to have it be um, insensitive to certain parameters or variations. So, you, so you know, one idea is you could imagine um, using some kind of adversarial networks uh, to uh, give you something that is um, insensitive to hadronization parameters. But that seems like a very hard, in practice, you know, in principle that sounds great. In practice, uh, I'm not sure how to do that in detail. It sounds hard, um, but it might be worth exploring. Um, and then I should also say, you know, there are these um, autoencoder approaches and just um, approaches that are looking for anomalies uh, in a sort of model independent way 
Okay, they're not always as model independent as they they would like to be, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I think that um, those kinds of ideas are probably going to be relevant here too. And so, um, but um, but for myself, I, I haven't actually uh, uh, incorporated machine learning into any of these um, uh, searches in in a, in a project. So yeah, I don't have a very uh, mature opinion about that. Just to say that there's you know, if you look around, you'll find uh, lots of different approaches already out there in the literature. Or any other questions? Hi, Professor. Uh, I have a question Hi. about the uh, long jump plan. Uh, I want to know uh, which situation uh, should we use the, uh, the long jump plan? Uh, I mean, uh, which, uh, which, 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 uh, which features, uh, mm, which features in the in a signal or um, background? And uh, and and then we will use the uh, long jet plan uh, help me to distinguish the sig signal from their back background better. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, one naive answer is just um, that you could imagine um, uh, applying this to events where you uh, where you do a cut uh, to remove this uh, area of the jet. But that's a lot like um, you know jet grooming techniques, and so um, the uh, it's actually something that that we're in the progress in, in the process of thinking about is um, you know maybe uh, like I was emphasizing here right in the original Lunjet paper they actually had some very clever ideas of using the Lunjet history the the tree that's generated by this declustering as an input to uh, machine learning algorithms and that gave them better uh, sensitivity to say W tagging. And so um, the we're hoping that the same kinds of ideas could be applied. Um, and so it would be um, the actually the, the, the history that you get when you run the algorithm to decluster uh, might be a useful input to some kind of search maybe using machine learning. Um, but um, but yeah, this is very much uh, cutting edge for us. So, so we're just now starting to really think seriously about um, how you would do this in a, in a realistic search. Um, it was a great question, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, I also have a question about the long jet plan. So could you explain again, um, what is the main reason uh, why the long jet plan can, can isolate the hydrogen station from the dark showers? Yeah, because it's it's. I mean, I, I didn't explain it in a lot of detail, but you know, the basic idea of the Lunjet plane is that um, the way it's designed is that different types of um, so different types of splittings that you might have, as illustrated in this uh, drawing here, uh, appear in different uh, different regions of the Lunjet plane, and so. Um, the type of non-perturbative splittings, right, that are dominated by, that we really don't have perturbative control over, um, they're all concentrated here in the bottom, okay? So that corresponds to either very collinear um, or these uh, dark red um, splittings like this one. And so, um, so it's really by design is that uh, you have, you know, like as illustrated here, you have hard collinear lies along this range, uh, ISR lies over here, non-perturbative down here, and soft kind of in the middle. And so um, that's why we can, you know, and we see it in our in our simulations, right? As we vary the hadronization, we see that uh, we're really varying this bottom part of the Lunjet plane where where hadronization is supposed to be uh, isolated. I see. Nice idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. Um, it's not, I can't take credit for for. I mean, you know, uh, of course these. Uh, these are some of the, the greatest theorists working in QCD. So uh, not surprising that they, um, they they came up with this very nice way of thinking about jets. OK. Um, so there's one uh, extra there's question. question. Yeah, in the, You're in the chat, yeah. Um, the difference between S and T channel production in the dark sector. Um, yeah, let me go back to that slide. Um, yeah, so it really. Um, Naively, you can just think about it this way, okay? So um, 
these are two different ways of uh, UV completing this contact operator. And um, the S channel is going to give you a feature, which is a resonance. Of course, if you have missing energy, that means the resonance is going to be kind of smeared out. And um, so in our original paper, uh, we proposed to use just the transverse mass distribution where you can still see a peak, although that peak gets kind of smeared out depending on how big R invisible is. Actually, I could highlight um, one of the people who was really driving the CMS uh, study, uh, Kevin Pedro, uh, just had a paper on HEP-PH uh, where he used machine learning to find the optimal variable to use for this kind of search, which I thought was um, seemed like a very cool idea. Um, and uh, and so that's a that's a paper maybe worth taking a look at. Um, it's, it's Kevin Pedro and and one other collaborator. Um, and um, whereas in the T channel case, that's a UV completion that looks like this, and so you don't get a resonance. Um, although, as I highlighted later, maybe I can go to that slide. Um, you do expect to make that mediator particle uh, on shell if it's light enough, and so. Um, so this can really impact, this in particular can really impact the kinematic distributions. Um, does that, uh, does that get to your question? So it's really just different choices of the portal. Um, and they have different kinematic features in the, uh, in the, in the pair production distributions. Uh, I have a question. Um, yes, please. Uh, in the dark side, uh, um, have any good way to deal with the way um uh your uh, jet jet uh, structure uh, structure. Uh, for example, uh -huh. BDT. Yeah. So um, in the CMS search, uh, they actually did some study where they used uh BDT to improve the tagging of these objects. Um. So you maybe that I mean. Of course, things that come out of the collaboration are much higher, tend to be much higher quality than than phenol literature because they have armies of people to work on these things and to criticize. Um, so yeah, if I don't know if this gets to your question, you may want to look and see what they did in this paper. Um, the preprint number is here. Uh, I want to know they uh, can they can get good uh, router. Use BDT. Um. Yeah. So they. I mean, they get they certainly get stronger limits. Um, like I like I've been emphasizing, you know, the hadronization uncertainty. You might worry that those stronger limits are too model dependent, and so um, sort of leave that to you to judge. Uh, if you, for me, I like the the limits. I'm I think the limits without adding any extra BDT or anything fancy are the ones that are probably more robust. Um, but I think it's interesting definitely to explore this kind of thing. And, and so, um, but it definitely improves the, um, I didn't include the plots here, uh, but, um, but yeah, if you go look in their paper, you can see how it improved the limits. Oh, okay. Sounds. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay. I, I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Mm, uh, actually, uh, for the collider search, the search, searching the dark matter, in principle, the, the difficulty is uh, how to split the missing energy uh, in, into different part and uh, uh, combine this part with the visible particles. Um, uh, inspired by this idea, uh, some variables like MT2 variable Result variable and like the recursive jigsaw reconstruction technique are developed. Uh, develop. uh, so I think uh, this technique, this new technique, uh, and new variables can uh, can improve the searching the semi invisible jet or, or, or something. Uh, can you give a comment? Um. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I agree. I think that, um, again, there's always this, um, this trade-off between um, trying to be very inclusive and using some of those more sophisticated variables like the ones you're, you're discussing, which may be more sensitive to the um, details of hadronization. Um, but um, mm -hmm. but it's, not, it's not so well explored. I mean, I, 
I would say if, um, again, I, I think I could highlight this uh, paper by Kevin Pedro um, from very recently um, where, where they're looking, there it's a little different. They're looking for um, the, basically the variable you would see that's kind of the Z prime peak, um, right? Because Kevin was the one who really drove this CMS search or one of the main, main drivers of the CMS search where they were looking for uh, signatures with uh, the on-shell Z prime production. And so um, uh, that might give you some inspiration if you're, if you're interested in, in studying this. But yeah, I think exploring um, the application of those variables is, is interesting. I will say, you know, back in, in when we wrote our first paper on this, we, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, trying to devise something that was kind of like MT2, but allowed for mm -hmm. there to be different amounts of dark matter on both sides. We had this very sophisticated variables that we were studying. And then um, uh, the student on that project, at some point, um, he uh, had been working on this for months. We you know, brainstormed this complicated stuff. And then he said, you know, I never just tried uh, transverse mass. And so, um, so he went and, it, you know, in five minutes, he could, he could just do a cut on transverse mass instead. And um, the performance that he got in our pheno study was essentially identical to what we had with this fancy variable. And so um, that completely changed our paper. Of course, if you go look at our first paper, it's, it's, it's phrased in this very simple way, which is good. I think it's always better to be simpler. Um, but um, yes, just to say yes. that, you know, we thought about that at the time, um, you know, now almost 10 years ago uh, in a lot of detail, but, um, but that doesn't mean that there's not something better out there. And again, this result using machine learning from Kevin Pedro makes it sound like uh, there's, uh, there's more room to find variables that, that would be uh, sensitive. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I encourage you to, to look at that and, and absolutely, I mean, I think uh, investigating um, better ways to do these searches is, would be very helpful. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Any further question or comment? So if no, let's thank our, our speaker again. Martin, uh, thank you very much to answer so many questions from us. So people are so interested in oh, your talk. Thank you very much for the engagement uh, and for, for uh, the invitation and taking the time. Um, hope to uh, see all of you in, in person sometime soon. Yeah, Tim, by the way, do you mind to share your talk slide with us? Oh, no problem. I'll, I'll email them to you. Yeah, I think people are interested to review your talk. Excellent. Okay, sounds good. Okay. I'll send that to you. Have a nice right. day. Thanks again. Take See care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.